Great. So welcome everybody to the April INC meeting. We're very excited to be back um, in this beautiful space. Thank you to Michael Henry. Um, you know, the Transportation Committee met here for quite a while and he's had other meetings here. I don't think we've had one. Um, zoning, sorry. Zoning. Okay. Um, since COVID maybe? I don't know. Maybe since COVID? I don't know. Uh, but we're totally excited to be back and it's such a beautiful April day. So, so great. Thank you very much um, for that. And we have an amazing panel of uh, folks that are going to, uh, we're going to have a really great discussion, I think, today on Vision Zero. So thank you everybody um, for taking some time um, to come today. Um, we're going to start with a land and equity acknowledgement. Um, Amber? Yeah. Yeah. Are you okay? Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, as, res as residents of Colorado, we stand on the unceded ancestral lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Lakota, and Ute Nations and Peoples. These lands were also the site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other Indigenous tribes. We recognize Native and Indigenous peoples as the original stewards of this land and our presence among their descendants who still dwell within it. We pay our respects to Indigenous and Native elders past and present. Equity acknowledgement. We acknowledge that racial injustice and equity and climate justice are, <laughs> thank you, are inextricably intertwined and that poor, vulnerable, and primarily Black, Indigenous, and people of color disproportionately bear the burden due to the lingering effects of systematic discriminatory practices. We commit to doing our part to ensure that when taking any action to create a sustainable and regenerative future, we will respect and promote and consider our respective obligations concerning all aspects of equity and strive to create systems in which, in in which we all can thrive. I think thrive. that's the end. <laughs> yes, in which Thanks. everyone can thrive. Perfect. Thanks so much, Amber. I appreciate and it. If, if everyone in the back wants to come up front, I know I, I have a hard time hearing you might have a hard time hearing but if you want to stay back there that's fine yeah i'm deliberately okay okay <laughs> um so uh can you check and make sure that everybody online can hear us um, so i think we have probably about 15 or so folks online um that might change oh uh yeah we gotta miss more too so um we have about 15 folks online we're very excited that we've been able to they can um, hear effectively do these owls and uh, make it a better experience for folks um, that, that aren't able to be here today. Um, so we're going to, especially when we do the discussion, there's going to be some back and forth with, with making sure that we are taking questions and whatnot from folks online too. So um, just bear with us uh, for that as well. Um, let's see if I go back. Oh, I've got to get my screen. So with that, I think... Great. I just want to um, give Michael a couple of quick minutes to say hi, and um, I can give you a mic too, Michael. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Henry, and I happen to live in this building. Um, probably the folks online can't really see the wonderful view of Cheeseman Park up out the window on the 19th floor. Uh, just two, two real quick historical things. I, I always like to remember history. Uh, one is that 12th Avenue, which is right underneath this building, um, was the spark that really generated at least the neighborhood movement in Capitol Hill. And that was when Mayor Bill McNichols, way, way, way back in about 1968, um, decided without telling or better yet asking anybody in the neighborhood that he wanted to turn 12th Avenue into a one-way street. And the whole idea back then was, how can the city make it easier for suburban folks to get in and out of the city with no regard to the health of the, the neighbors and the neighborhoods right along those streets? 
At any rate, that generated an incredible uproar in the neighborhood. And um, everybody in the neighborhood was able to persuade Mayor Buckethead and, and his cabinet to back off from that plan. And back then, after that happened, the, the neighbors who worked so hard on that said, boy, that was fun. <laughs> we, 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 we ought to stick together and we ought to work to help improve the neighborhood. And that was what generated capital oriented neighborhoods. And two, two of the initial founders of that were uh, Pat Schroeder, who many of you are going to this East Congresswoman, who was so wonderful, and Kathy Donahue, City Councilwoman. The only other thing I'd like to share is about the history of the park. Uh, as, as everybody knows, Denver was founded down near Confluence Park. Cherry Creek and South Platte come together down And the population center was down there for a very long time. It kept in all directions. This was nothing out here in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. Chaseman Park, or where this is, was the site of the first official hanging of a criminal. And uh, it was done by the, by the government. And uh, they decided they needed a place to bury that unfortunate person and they buried him out here and there were more and more people who were buried here and it was a very segregated cemetery. Cheeseman Park here was the Protestant section and the, the Paupers area was down towards 8th Avenue. And the Catholic area is what is now the Botanic Gardens. And the tourist section is what is now over towards Congress um, Park. And as more and more people, including particularly wealthy people, moved out this direction, they said, we don't want a cemetery right next to our houses. And the cemetery was very dilapidated. Um, and a lot of the stones had fallen over. Um, and, and The inhabitants were eventually moved to the Northside Cemetery or Cemetery. And, and, and just about any time when there's digging going on in Cheeseman Park or the irrigation pipes or anything, They'll find some bones, yes. <laughs> leftover bones. And uh, there is a protocol with the medical examiner's office that whenever anybody finds a, a, a body, they don't quite know where it came from. They have to call the medical examiner. Uh, at any rate, you're, you're welcome to walk around 
the part of the theory, but it really is the centerpiece of this part of the main Thank Thanks, Michael. Uh, would you like a mic? Um, so people can hear us? Oh, yeah. So I will just say for anybody that's using a mic today that the speaker, um, the owl won't track to you. Um, if you're using a Michael or a mic, it will, it will track to um, the speaker. Yeah. So just so you know that. Um, yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Chris Hines. I serve on Denver City Council representing District 10. If you don't know where Denver's perfect 10 is, well, you're in it. Um, so thanks for coming uh, to District 10. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation today. Um, the reason why I got involved with uh, politics in Colorado is because of access to transportation for people with disabilities. Um, I, I, as most of you know, in case you don't, uh, the Democratic National Convention was hosted here in Denver in August, August of 2008. Um, August 26, 2008, the Tuesday night of the DNC was the last day I could walk. Um, I was a cyclist. Um, I was an avid cyclist. I uh, was one of those uh, two percenters that always rode in the street because that's the law. I always rode my bike um, uh, and stopped at every stoplight because that's the law. I waited until the, the light turned green because that's the law. And here I am uh, now in a wheelchair uh, because, uh, because I was on a bike and got hit by a car uh, the Tuesday night of the DNC, August 26, 2008. So, um, this is a personal conversation to me. It's a um, it, uh, vision zero is very important uh, that that we um, have started tracking uh, our pedestrian and cyclist uh, fatalities and and serious injuries. Um, hopefully, uh, in case uh, there there are a fair amount of advocates that call this zero vision, and it's unfortunate that Amy Ford is uh, our head of Gaudi is out right now picking someone up from the ground floor because. Um, I think that it is important for us to, to note that other than 2020, every year the number has gone up. And this is a game of golf. We should have a low score, not a high score. So um, this is, uh, like I said, this is very personal to me. It's the reason why I got politically involved at the state. It is the reason why I sought office um, uh, in city council. Transportation is my jam. So um, not only is it my personal mission, um, it is the mission of District 10. Um, so we have arterials like Colfax and Broadway and Lincoln and Colorado and um, 13th and 14th and 6th and 8th and 17th and York and, uh, and Downing. I mean, we have so many arterials, Park Avenue West. Um, meanwhile, uh, you know, a lot of those uh, arterials is uh, Michael, actually probably Michael. It's hard for me to not call him Mr. Henry, but he really likes it for me to call him Michael. Um, uh, as, as he mentioned, there, there are, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a movement to make sure that people can get into Denver in the morning and out of Denver at night. Um, so all those arterials are all over District 10. Meanwhile, um, uh, you know, we've had uh, homes on these streets since the 1880s, 1890s. And uh, and there are people trying to teach their kids and grandkids to ride a bike while people are careening down our streets. So, um, so it's very important for us to have this conversation. Um, it's important for us, uh, for our economic vitality to have access to, uh, you know, to our center city uh, for pe from people all over the metro region. Um, and uh, our airport, I chair the biz committee that oversees the airport. Uh, we have the um, third busiest airport in North America, fifth busiest airport in the world. Um, we have nearly 220 direct destinations. It would be lovely if we could get all of those people from all of those destinations uh, to our airport. They could take the A-line to Union Station, and then they could spend all their sales tax dollars um, or all their money and give us sales tax revenue. Um, and uh, and they go home. <laughs> um, and uh, so, uh, so anyway, so I'm I'm really excited to uh, to hear um, this panel this morning. Uh, we have such a great group here that I'm not on it. <laughs> um, Just and, stay there. You yeah, can be yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, so I do have four other events today, um, including I'm a strong member of the uh, Democratic Party. Our state uh, uh, convention is also today. 
Um, so I won't be here for the whole time, but I will try to stick around as long as I can. So um, thank you. Is there is there anything else I should? That's great. Say? That's yeah. awesome. Super. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. I, okay. I I just have a couple of quick announcements, and I think we're going to get into the Vision Zero discussion. Yeah, they're not good. They're good. Um, um, one, the first is, and I don't know if she's online yet. Um, she might, she might um, not have joined yet. But I, I did want to say a big congratulations to Jane Warner. Um, uh, I didn't, I didn't know Jane that much because she's not currently on the executive committee um, until we had some some really great conversations last fall. Um, but she's been around um, with Inc. in neighborhoods for a long time. I think 24 years. Uh, is how long she's been around in um, neighborhood organizing in Winston Downs and with, with INC. And she's going to get a proclamation um, at City Council, I believe, um, April 15th, uh, so coming up. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that uh, Jane had, has done for Inc. Um, and, and one's been, she, you know, she was a board member, an executive committee member. Um, she, she started or ran the annual dinner that we do. She ran our newsletter and our weekly up email updates. Um, very importantly, she helped get started with our sponsorship programs um, and our silent auction. She's raised over $50,000 for, for INC, which has gone out to programming for neighborhoods around Denver. So uh, just a, a ton of great things. And we're very excited that um, you know, one of our owners is getting recognized by the city this week. Uh, so I think um, so that's that's really great. Um, and if she's on later, we might uh, come back to her for a second. After that, I also, moving on to the next Jane. Um, where is Jane? Oh, great. Uh, so Jane Potts has uh, helped to organize in a, a great event um, in May uh, at the Table Public House. And I, did I get it right that it's Rosedale Harbor Gulch, right? And, and Overland and Park, RNOs, are putting together a, our May monthly programming, um, which is going to include uh, Joanne Clark from the Parks and Rec Office, Elizabeth Babcock, and I, the council member is going to be four. Four, Albrecht, and I believe Jamie Torrance. Oh, perfect. So, um, <laughs> you know, the city council will be there at our May meeting. And um, I also wanted to say that this is a perfect example of the new initiative that Inc. has started this year, which is um, to get participating RNOs to host uh, different meetings around the city. So if your RNO would like to host one, um, we would love to have the same uh, thing happen with you, and we're happy to work with you. Um, we're doing $250 for, for any RNO that wants um, to host a meeting, or $300 if you're in a nest neighborhood. Um, and you know, it's it's a little it's loose in terms of what we're asking for, but um, we're hoping that you can find a venue um, that you can maybe uh, work with us to line up some speakers for the for the event, and then help with uh, coffee and snacks as well. So uh, we're really hoping to promote this program uh, to different RNOs around the city, and and hoping that they'll take us up on that offer um, for for some free money um, to help put that on. Uh, so thanks again to Jane. Uh, for taking a huge load off of the Inc. Executive Committee for the month of May um, to do that. And, um, Yay. Yay. Uh, yeah. Uh, next thing, and I will turn it over to uh, Amber and Judy for this, is just to save your date um, right now, uh, put it, get it on your calendars, um, because we're going, we're heading to Rhino uh, to do a couple of joint programs. Ah. So uh, the joint program nature is a little education, a little gathering to have some training and also hear from uh, RNOs from around the city about how we can really serve them. And so we'll have a couple of tracks uh, and activities from probably about one uh, to 2.30 or so, 3.30, sorry, about two hours of that. And then within walking distance, we think we're going to head over to Spangling, yeah. um, a black owned brewery in Rhino, right on Welton, right off of RTD. So if you want to take the light rail, that'd be great. Um, and then we're going to have some art, art vendors, maybe some hands-on art. Um, details are still fluid, but we will have information out to you guys, more solid information, but save the day. Yeah. Great. June 22nd. June 22nd, June 22nd in the afternoon. So great. Yeah. With that, I think we can. Um...
uh, go to Vision Zero uh, discussion. Great. I will. I will take it from here. So thank you everyone for joining us to learn about the what I call the near future of Vision Zero uh, in Denver. And we could not have planned a, a better event with an all-star panel. I, I wish literally all of Denver was in this room right now because this is a really important conversation. It's important to me personally, as Councilman Hyde said, it's personal to him. Uh, I bike commute uh, and I ride past the ghost bike every day when I commute to work. Uh, and it reminds me of, 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 of how important this stuff is to work out so that we could all be safe on, on the roads that, that we sh share and should share. Uh, so we have Jill Lacantor here. We have Amy Ford. We have San Lee. We have June Churchill, which is our Denver bike mayor, which I assume is appointed and not elected because I didn't I didn't vote, but That's I would vote correct. for him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then Al Alan Cowgill, who's our community representative. So you have a swath here uh, of different people from different areas. We're going to start with presentations from Jill and then San. And then we'll get into the panel discussion. And in the panel discussion, we're going to swap off between uh, me moderating with questions that were uh, developed in advance. And then we'll go to the audience for or the attendees or whatever you want to call the community for uh, other questions. So we'll alternate. So think about what you want to ask during the presentations or if you've already thought about it. And we'll, we will get to those questions and, and alternate off. So I'll start with um, Jill, and you can. Can I just stand ask up, one thing and, um, yeah. from everyone uh, that that's involved with this, which yeah. is there's people online, and I think people here that maybe not aren't familiar with some of the terms. Um, so if you can kind of clarify terms like Vision Zero, you know, um, or Ghost Bike, I think a lot of um, that might be helpful along the way too, just so people don't have to ask. Um, but yeah. That's great. Thanks. So like a Ghost Bike, for instance, is somebody that's been hit. Um, Killed. Somebody killed. that's been yeah. killed, killed. Yeah. Been killed. So just so everybody knows. Thanks. And they put up a white bike. So if you ever see a white bike chained to something, that is what that represents. A person that has died on their bike. And near me in Sloan's Lake, there's a um, wheelchair, a white wheelchair. Yeah. So. All right, Jill. It's yours. Amy and June, do you guys want to move so you're not <laughs> looking <laughs> over your shoulder at the presentation? Uh, do I need no, the no, mic or? Yes, okay, people in the back are nodding. Good morning. Thank you, Michael, for hosting us here. Those of you online, you are really missing out with this, this beautiful view of, of Cheeseman Park. Um, and Gretchen actually reminded me earlier, we held our first Vision Zero Memorial to honor the lives lost to traffic crashes. I believe it was seven years ago in May, right here in Cheeseman Park at this pavilion. So this is definitely something we've been working on for a long time. Um, next slide. Just a reminder to everybody uh, who the Denver Streets Partnership is. I'm Jill Locantore. I'm the executive director of the Denver Streets Partnership. We are a coalition of community groups who are advocating for people-friendly streets here in Denver. We have about two dozen different organizations that are part of our coalition right now. Uh, the logos on this slide are the members of our advisory council, which we work with most closely on developing our policy campaigns and doing advocacy work. And they include, include groups that are focused on specific forms of transportation. So Denver Bike Lobby, also Pedestrian Dignity. We have Alejandro from Pedestrian Dignity, Greater Denver Transit, um, but also groups that care about transportation because it intersects with so many parts of our lives. We have environmental groups, groups that care about access for people with disabilities, the intersections with housing and affordability. And we have neighborhood associations, everybody from downtown Denver out to Montbello. Um, if your neighborhood association wants to join our coalition, we would welcome you. Please just reach out. Next slide. Our collective mission is to reduce our city's unsustainable dependency on cars um, and to design communities that prioritize people. Our vision is that human dignity should be the guiding principle in the way we design our transportation systems and our neighborhoods so that everybody can thrive and connect to what matters to them. Next slide. These are the various outcomes that we are working on. It's at the bottom, but it's probably the most important one, the vision zero goal of eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries. 
Um, and we have been at the table since the beginning when they first adopted this goal and have been developing their plans over the years. Next slide. So unfortunately, we still have a long way to go to get to zero traffic fatalities. The numbers are continuing to go up here in Denver, statewide in Colorado, nationally. Um, the last few years, we've had more than 80 people killed each year just trying to get around our city. Um, and the reasons are actually pretty straightforward. I've summarized it in one sentence here. There are too many cars and trucks that are too heavy and too tall, driving too fast on streets that are too wide with too many conflict points. So I'm just gonna quickly go through each of those in a little bit more detail and what the solution is. So next slide. Too many cars and trucks. This was actually a very compelling stat from the city's recent update of their Vision Zero Action Plan. 99% of traffic fatalities involve somebody driving a motor vehicle. And if you think about it, that's not surprising. Cars and trucks weigh thousands of pounds. They can go very fast. We make them widely available to your average human who may not be that talented at driving it. It's no surprise that vulnerable human beings with our soft bodies don't stand much of a chance. Um, and so disproportionately, the people who are victims of traffic crashes are people walking, people biking, people on motorcycles. A lot of people in cars are also the victims of traffic crashes. By contrast, I want to point out over this 10 year period that the city analyzed, there were zero people riding transit who were killed. That's actually the safest way to get around the city. So next slide, what's the solution? We need to invest in making options other than driving cars and trucks a viable and convenient way to get around. Um, we did an analysis recently. If, if we invested $2.2 billion in transit service over the next 10 years, what could that get us? It could increase the number of frequent bus routes where the bus comes at least every 15 minutes from 34 to 83 bus routes. So the map of all those blue lines which would basically double the share of people in the larger Denver metro area who live within walking distance of a frequent transit route. Um, that would be about 65% of the population. That would go a long way towards making it easier for people to choose options other than driving or walking, or other than driving. We want them to walk. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Cars and trucks are too heavy and too tall. The top slide um, is pedestrian fatalities, that top chart in blue. The bottom one in orange is the, the share of vehicles that are particularly large, like SUVs and pickup trucks. Surprise, they've been going up in concert. Um, and there's really good data showing that bigger trucks are much more deadly, particularly for pedestrians. Instead of hitting you in the leg, they hit you in the chest or the head. They're more likely to drag you underneath the vehicle. Those taller vehicles have much worse visibility. It's harder for people to see pedestrians in the first place. And so there's more and more compelling evidence that simply the size of our vehicles is a big contributing factor. Next slide. So what's the solution? Regulate vehicle design. Just like we make vehicles have seat belts and airbags, they should also have protections for people outside of the car. Ultimately, this is something that has to happen at the federal level to truly have an impact. But there are things we can do here locally in New York City. They have a safe vehicle fleet transition plan where they're replacing city-owned vehicles with smaller, more safely designed vehicles. And there's cities like Washington, D.C., where they've dramatically increased the cost of registering a large vehicle, sending a signal to people they don't want large vehicles in their city. They want smaller, safer vehicles that are appropriate for an urban environment. Next slide. Cars and trucks are going too fast. Speed, it's the biggest factor that determines whether a crash is going to happen in the first place and whether it's gonna result in a serious injury or fatality. Again, this is data from the city's Vision Zero Action Plan. Really, in an urban area, we don't want cars going more than 20, 25 miles an hour because that's what it's safe to interact with people outside of cars. Next slide. So the solution's pretty obvious. Let's lower the speed limits. The city's already done that for neighborhood streets. The default speed limit's now 20 miles an hour. We'd like to see that on the arterial streets as well. And then we need to back that up with street designs that reinforce those safer speeds, traffic calming treatments like the traffic circles, you like them or not, they're very effective at slowing down traffic, things like speed humps, and then equitable use of automated enforcement. Very good data. If you know you're gonna get a ticket going over the speed limit because 24 seven there's a camera giving tickets, very few people will speed on that corridor. Next slide. 
Our streets are too wide and there's too many conflict points. If you look at the high injury network, the 5% of the streets where 50% of the traffic fatalities are happening, there are gigantic arterial streets like Colfax, Federal, Colorado Boulevard, Alameda. They are designed like highways to move as many cars as fast as possible. That is just inherently unsafe in urban environments where you have lots of people walking and biking and trying to access transit or just existing in that public space because streets are public space too. So the solution, next slide. We need to transform those urban arterials into truly people-friendly main streets. And we're just starting to do that. We have a great example that we celebrated just last weekend on Broadway. It used to be you know, five lanes of vehicular traffic all going in one direction into downtown. Now we have both a dedicated bus lane and a dedicated bike lane that simultaneously slows down the remaining vehicular lanes, reduces the amount of space that pedestrians have to cross over those vehicular lanes, and provide safe space free of conflict for transit for the bike riders. And the data again is very compelling that that makes streets safer for everybody, including the drivers. And we have plans to do similar changes on Colfax Avenue with bus rapid transit. CDOT is now leading planning for bus rapid transit on Federal Boulevard and Colorado Boulevard. And San is going to talk about that some more. We should be doing that on all of our arterial streets and we should be doing it tomorrow. Next slide. So what can you do? These, these, like I said, the reasons why fatalities are happening are pretty clear. The solutions are pretty obvious. The hard part is the politics because this is a pretty big change to the status quo. People don't like change. And so one of the most important things you can do is speak up and say, you know what? I value my safety and the livability of my community over the speed and convenience of driving. You say that to your friends, your neighbors, your family members, you come to meetings like this, you speak up and you vote. <laughs> we aren't having a mayor or city council election anytime soon, but there's an RTD board election coming up. Our state legislators are constantly being voted on and there's ballot initiatives. There's one that will likely come to you to vote on increased funding for transit. So using your voice, speaking up for safe streets is one of the most important things that you can do to help us achieve the Vision Zero goals. And that's it for me. I think we're holding questions until the end. Yeah, we're going to do the panel after, so Sam's up next. Yeah. Perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you for hosting, Michael. Uh, my name is Sam Lee. I'm the state traffic engineer for CDOT. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, I think one of the new uh, changes that CDOT is making is engaging more with neighborhoods, with the public. So this is a, one of our first steps of many, uh, so appreciate that today. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about advancing transportation safety, what it means, what it means to Colorado. Uh, we have uh, jurisdiction over all the state highways, so anything that's numbered um, is primarily what we focus on, but we also partner with Denver, we partner with other cities and counties to make sure that we support them in all their safety initiatives as well. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about this one or um, yeah, you can just jump into it. That's fine. Um, so what is advancing transportation safety? It's about all of us working together, having those discussions, making sure that you're heard and that you understand some of the context of why projects are coming through the pipeline. Um, increase coordination with all safety fields. I'm an engineer and today over this last, or I think over this last year, we're sitting side by side with behavioral specialists, communication specialists, and we're all having discussion on what we can do to improve safety. I think that's a, a, new, a new way of thinking and all ideas are good ideas. We always bring everything to the table. Um, and I, I'm excited to be here today. I'm committed and I, so, I see that all of you are taking your own time to be here today. So I hope that we have some good discussion to talk about safety and some of the things that you guys are seeing um, out on our runways. Um, information sharing. I think uh, within Denver, they have their uh, Denver Police Department has crash records. Uh, we get crash records from everyone through the throughout the state. But what's really important is getting those crash records to CDOT as soon as possible. So we, as a, a state agency, can kind of see the patterns. And what Denver is seeing is definitely scale that up. We're seeing that across the state, especially in urban areas. Our mission, again, is to push education 
engineering, we work with law enforcement. They are always sitting at the table as well because uh, post-crash care is very important. When a crash happens, uh, we wanna make sure that those crashes are efficiently moved off the highway because every nine minutes if they're out on the highway, there's more likelihood that there'd be a secondary crash. So it's important that we all work together. Uh, and I love it being an engineer, sitting with first responders. Uh, I'm learning a lot and I think they're learning a lot from the engineering side. Um, if there's no law enforcement pull off areas, uh, we wanna make sure that we accommodate them in the engineering side. So those are the kind of the benefits that come from just having this, these discussions. Yes. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. And uh, similar to Jill, we partner with a lot of advocacy groups across the state. This is this too is a representation of of our coalition that we meet with on a bi-monthly basis. Um, we have all the state agencies across the board, uh, but we also work with SAD, Commercial Motor Carriers Association, AAA. Um, I think in the past, you know, there's everyone has their goal politically of what they want to push forward, but it's important we sit down in a safe environment and have those conversations. And that's what I've seen over the last year is just open conversation. What do we all need to do as a collective um, with all the data and with all the specialists that we have in different areas? We split up our initiatives at CDOT into five areas. Um, it's similar to an FHWA model, except we have culture in the middle. That is the most important uh, piece in working towards safety. Right, it's using your voice. It's having those conversations. Me being here today, you being here today. It's about spreading the word and looking at that your neighbors, your your kids, making sure that they take those safety initiatives forward. Right, if they don't see friends buckling up, it's okay for them to say, "Hey, why don't you buckle up?" <laughs> or not go in that car if they're not right. Uh, we also work on safe roads. That's the engineering side of it. I'm not going to go through all of it, but safe driving, behavioral, that is a big part of, of safety right now. We're seeing an upward trend in serious injuries and fatalities. And then we also wanna protect safety. We wanna protect our people, vulnerable road users, right? How can we protect pedestrians where highways are over-engineered, I would say, to increase speeds um, in those areas. So we're doing road diets, we're looking at uh, meet more medians to prevent pedestrians from jaywalking and crossing in areas that they should not be. Um, and medians are a natural engineering tool that actually constricts the roadway and helps people slow down. And then finally, like I mentioned before, post-crash care, very important, right? I think one of the big examples that I see is CDOT has these truck-mounted attenuators, and these attenuators are meant to take an impact from large vehicles, right? They are crash cushions by all means out on the roadway. So when we see post when we see a, a crash and you see the fire truck kind of park diagonally, right? That's that's a $5 million device out there. So we as CDOT come out behind them and we put our truck mounted attenuators, which we, we can repair for about a hundred thousand. So we don't want those trucks to get hit. We're all working together. And then the fire trucks can, I mean, they're Whenever, and I just want to talk about this. Whenever there's a crash, it's always the responsibility of the tow uh, companies to come out and sweep. But through these conversations, you see first responders grabbing brooms, they're cleaning up, they want to get off that roadway together with everybody else. So it's just a, a new culture shift, which I, I'm always excited to see. There's just one after that. Yeah, there. Is that the one you want? No, I think there was some okay. action items. All right. I'm sorry. No, no, that's all right. I think it just it doesn't want to land on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's so weird. We saw a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just a, a teaser. But... Yeah, I, was, I don't know what's going on here. Oh, wait. Sorry, is this one? Oh, yeah. maybe it just it's just the one after that. It's that one. Maybe, we did that one. Maybe it gets it deleted. Yeah. 30. Is the oh, next one. That's, that's so odd. That's okay. But uh, I think I can I can speak to some of those actions. Okay. I can bring it up later too. Oh yeah. No. Or if I can go back to your other. No, so it's just fine. Okay. Okay. Um, so behind all these emphasis areas, it's great to talk about it, but we're actually taking action 
in all of these areas. And I'll speak to one specifically, and that's speed. So our engineering studies for speed are changing this year and what we what data we use to set those speed limits. So we're using more context, right? I think in the past, it was based on what 85% of the people were traveling at, and that can be pretty high, right? So the, uh, at the federal level, they've changed the rule where we can use more context. What is that context? If there's a uh, less rapid transit, if there's a school nearby, if there's curbing better, we will not put, the, put a speed above 45 miles per hour. Um, so that's kind of our start. Then we look at context, we look at the 85th percentile just for information, but we also look at the 50th percentile. And that's how we're starting to set speed limits on state highways. We're just kicking it off this year, but I think it's exciting that we can now set highways. We have a little bit more freedom um, to look at the context. How many bicycles, how many peds are we seeing there? And so my engineers are going out there, they're counting. They're going out there, they're looking at intersections, they're looking at schools, and they're counting how many peds go through that, through that area in the day. And if it's 45, they will go down to 35. They will look at new speeds that are, that accommodate that area. But we also want to engineer it down as well. Slide. Um, real quick, I just wanted to touch on our BRT initiatives. I think all of us are aware that Senate Bill 260 is what pushed this initiative for Colorado. Uh, we've got three projects. Uh, we're committing $170 million to these BRT projects. Um, What's BRT? Bus Rapid Transit. Thank you. Bus rapid transit. So what it is, it's it's providing buses uh, more efficiency to pull off. They have their they have their own thank you. They have their own lanes, so it helps them pull off. You can if you're a pedestrian or a bicyclist, you have a safer area. You're not right by the road. You're actually there's a median typically between where the bus and the bus stop will be. So next slide. And so here are the three projects. I think you're heard a little bit about uh, federal in Colorado. We are in the preliminary design stages. So we're working with um, all the stakeholders to make sure that we can come into agreement. We're going through the environmental processes, but right now we've already kicked off the design of uh, State Highway 119 uh, near Longmont. Really excited to see that. We've got a strong team working on that, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what the timelines were for these, for these three projects. Um, Colorado 119, federal, and of course, Colorado. Okay, and this is my final slide. I think uh, when I talk about the power of in influence, I went to a conference just Sunday and I had this panel of teenagers and they are, they're just perfect examples of traffic engineers uh, or, or people who want to work in traffic, but at their schools, they run initiatives to make sure that their students, uh, that their colleagues in high school wear their seatbelts, right? After a football game, they're out there with, with boards and they're advocating for their fellow students. Uh, when they get in cars, if one of their friends are texting and driving, they say, hey, can I take that phone and text for you so that you can focus on the road? This, these are the kind of things that I get inspired about because it's happening at, at the high school level where students are just learning to drive and I think with all of us here at our individual level, we have influence, right? We have influence today, everyone around you, in your family, your friends, your school or work, something you can talk about. And then finally at the community level, if we want policy, we all have to come together and we all have to work together to advocate for that policy. So thank you. I mean that, yeah. Okay. Great. Come on up, Amy, June, and Alan. Thank you so much. That's that's kind of a primer. We didn't want to give you like a 40-minute presentation on every single detail of Vision Zero and traffic safety. So this is an opportunity for us to have a discussion. We're going to switch off, like I said, between the moderator, me, and the community for questions. Uh, we're going to don't take it personally if I'm if I'm cut you off. We're going to try and keep things flowing and focused uh, between these questions. So let's try and stay on topic and avoid rabbit holes, right? I know we all love to get into those 
details about our own neighborhoods and everything, but let's try and keep the big picture in mind, which is vision zero, safety, and reducing fatalities on our roads. So the- Pass that other one. Yeah, I don't need that, I'm loud. Here, take it. Yeah, and let's let's have um, Amy and June and Alan introduce themselves really quick because they have- Thanks. I'm Amy Ford. I'm the executive director of the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, I am June Churchill. I'm the Denver bike mayor. What that actually means is that I was appointed by City Council of Cyclists to, uh, I don't know, go talk to the media, do policy, do policy advocacy and stuff. Professionally, I do legislative analysis and lobbying. Good morning, my name is Alan Cogill. I am uh, a member of the Sloan's Lake Citizens Group. I'm excited to have Keith here uh, from Sloan's Lake as well. Um, and I also serve on the Department of Transportation of Infrastructure uh, Advisory Board as one of the co-chairs of that. Um, also volunteer with Denver Streets Partnership and uh, Denver Bicycle Lobby too. So the, the theme of of this discussion is community advocacy and staying in action around Vision Zero, right? So not just talking about it, but doing, right? So in that spirit, I'm gonna start it off with the first question, which is how do we ensure that Vision Zero safety investments go where they're most needed, ju just not where people are the most vocal? And anyone could start. I think we, if you pa pass the mic around, just to whoever wants to. Uh, I can go. I submitted this question. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think to me, what it really comes down to is every single room that I'm in where we're talking about this, I look around the room and I see who is here and I think about who's not here. I look at the demographics of our city, I look at all the maps. And I think which voices are not being represented in these conversations. And then I try to educate myself about those areas. I try to educate myself about those needs and then actually visiting there. The road I probably think most about is actually Federal Boulevard. Um, and I don't live near Federal, but I think about it a ton because I think it's emblematic of a bunch of our city's problems in history. And also, you know, that means I'm not just thinking about my neighborhood. I'm thinking holistically about everywhere else in the city because, hey, if my neighborhood has a really engaged citizens group, great. They're probably going to get stuff done. They're probably going to get investment there. Who doesn't have a seat at the table? What can we do to make sure they do get a seat at the table? And what can we do to make sure that us as individuals, when we're lobbying for this stuff, that we aren't just asking for help for our own neighborhoods and our own communities, but for the entire city and for the people who do not have that power themselves? So, so let me add to that data, that's how. And I'm joined by Rolf Eisinger, who leads our Vision Zero programs uh, at DOTI. DOTI is again the acronym for the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. And we're joined also by Chief Thomas, who, uh, as you're aware, is works very closely with us as we sit and we think about crash and crash data and the number one issue that Jill so articulately put on the table, which is fatalities. And, you know, let me, I, I'm gonna answer the question, but let me just sort of start with a, a little bit of a statement and, you know, just some observations and where we are. I've been in the job for about 14 weeks now or so. And on week two, we had a very deep, deep conversation with the entire transportation team. And that conversation was this. And I've shared this with others. It's going to be more formal here in a, in a couple of weeks with the mayor and others. We are striving for a city that is vibrant and affordable and safe. And when we talk about that safety, we know that we are going the wrong direction when it comes to the people who use our roads, who walk, who bike, who roll, who drive. The reality is, is that we're losing the battle on people losing their lives on our roads. So the goal that I have set and the objective that we have set is beyond Vision Zero, which is always our objective and goal. But it is a direct, it's measurable, it's about data. How can we reduce the fatalities on our roads by 50% in the next two years? That is ambitious, it is hard, it is gonna be difficult, and yet it is an imperative 
on how we, we as Dottie, as community members, as our partners with CDOT, as our partners with the Denver Street Partnerships, with our transportation advisory boards, with all of you, live a life in Denver that is affordable and safe and vibrant. And if we don't have that safety and that condition, we are, we are losing that battle. So I'm saying this out loud to you all because of a couple things and how we talk about and answer this question. We know, as Jill well pointed out, what the problem is. It is speed. Speed, speed, speed and speed, and we know where it's happening. And that was the beauty of what Rolf and team brought starting out on week two and how we sit and we talk about these challenges and problems. So the goal that I said, and the goal that the entire team has embraced after a, a little bit of like gulping and going, my God, can we really do that in two years? And I was like, we must try to do it in two years. And even if we get to 30% reduction, then my God, we've saved lives. And that's what it, this is about. And so, for instance, last week, just this last week, we had a very deep, long, two to three hour workshop with CDOT to talk about exactly this and everything, you guys, is on the table. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that just in context of that question, and so I'm taking just a titch more time. But I want to make sure that we understand where our commitment is. How do we do it? It's low cost, quick, fast. What are the most impactful things that we can do? How do we change our signal light timing so that there was always pedestrian leading intervals on every high injury network that we have? How do we think dynamically about illumination of where people are going and where they are crossing? How do we think about things like a leading pedestrian individual in interval is when you take a light and you have a cross for someone, for a pedestrian to go across the street, you give them a lot more time to get across the street before you start changing the time for the vehicles to go. That's what that means. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim. So all of these ideas are being put together and we're thinking about how we apply them in at least one quarter here in 24, how we do that across the entire 35 uh, high injury networks here in the next year or two, and how we then bring that into all of our safety zones and areas. We're gonna ask you all to work hard with us as we do this, as we think about it, as we think about where we go and how we go, where we spend our money and where we spend our dollars. So long-winded to go back to the last question. How do we also account for that? How do we create levels of equity? How do we ensure that we make sure that we're addressing the needs that are out there? We do that also again through data and through extensive communications with our public and others. The data is gonna tell us where we wanna go. And that's a really, really important thing. And we will work with communities and we know there are priority areas. And we know that people will be flagging a certain school zone or a certain crosswalk or a certain roadway. And as we move through all of these processes and plans, we also wanna make sure that we go where the data is telling us to go because that is gonna take that goal and then we're gonna achieve it. So just a quick note on all of that, well, not a quick note, but I wanted to be able to share <laughs> some of where we were, some of where our priorities, I'd love to talk about it later, but um, but I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. So we are. that's good information. Let's come back to the, yeah. we're gonna come back to the funding again. Yes, Let's take a question from the audience, the attendees, the community. This is going to be hard because I don't know who to you call. You can wait for me. I can wait for you. Somebody else. I think someone in the back went up first. So go ahead. Um, hi, uh, my name is Kristen. I am on the University Hills Neighborhood Association. University Hills is bordered by Camden Avenue, which is Auto 25, Auto um, Boulevard, Color 2, and I 25. One challenge and one thing our interest our community is really interested in is improving communities pedestrian and bicyclist safety. Uh, can you talk a little bit more on how decisions are made when a safety uh, pedestrian safety survey happens and specifically in those those areas in, in that different environment? We can Sandy talk sure. to it. Um, yeah, again, Sam, I'm happy to talk through that. Um, so I'm sorry, just for the people that are online, would you mind re question. repeating the question sorry. a little oh, bit or yes, summarizing gonna, it? Yes. Yeah, just because they might not hear it. Anyway. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I'm going to try to rephrase the question. It's it's how do uh, bicyclists and pedestrian facilities get prioritized? And what's the process uh, when looking at corridors? Is that sound about right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, number one, we do... Uh, region one specifically, which covers that area, just completed a, a bicycle and pedestrian prioritization study. So we reached out to the community. We pushed uh, public information out, um, advertisements out where the community communities could tell us where they're seeing issues. 
Uh, they are actually using that data right now to prioritize uh, where we're going to start putting this funding. I know we don't want to jump into, into the funding, but we've at CDOT committed funding. Um, university is, is definitely a CDOT roadway. Um, I forget the highway number, but uh, it is getting prioritized. And I think there's some channels where you can continue to provide that information. And that's through our CDOT website. I will tell you every traffic related um, comment or question or concern comes to myself or one of the region traffic engineers. And we all take a look at every single one of those and spend time on it. But right now, the best way is to talk about the corridor and we can put eyes on it. We can look at the traffic counts, the bicycle counts. And then that's where we would look as a collective of where we would put our funding. And that's happening right now. So it's a good time to email us through our website and just put attention traffic engineer. And to follow on that. And to follow on that, and I'll let Rolf actually answer a little bit of question. Obviously, at Dottie, we have an extensive process where we do analysis on these roadways. A big part of our planning and sort of our North Star is the Denver Moves Everyone uh, recent study and our plan, which guides our what we call our six-year CIP, our Capital Improvement Program. And attached to that, we have several priorities, and safety is the number one priority on many of the improvements that we make in the corridors for pedestrian improvements, bicycling improvements, as well as transit improvements. We've done things also just like this last week, which we announced at the Broadway uh, bikeway uh, opening, where we are taking the policies of how we prioritize people in our roadway design, our policies of how we prioritize things like mode shift, i.e. how do we move people out of single occupant vehicles, and then what I'm going to continue to announce is our safety priority and what that and policy and what that means. The reason I bring up those policies is because that is also how we drive down the thought, the engineering, and the solutions into our engineering teams and our design teams and others. So it doesn't sit up here and sound really pretty in a plan, but it actually gets driven through the organization and how our team and others think about it. But there's a combination of prioritization data that we can sit and talk about and I'll let Ralph just recently bring it up. How we plan our capital improvement projects that are constantly infused and informed by safety data and that. And then how we also then look at even rapid response when we see things that are happening on roadways, we see major injuries or, or fatalities that happen at certain areas, intersections. We have an entire team and our rapid response team that goes in and actually looks at improvements and other things we can make right then and there to try to see if we could mitigate that and help that never happen again. But Ralph, you want to talk a little bit more about the broader Vision Zero plan, which also addresses some of that as we go. I, yeah, sure. So uh, just kind of addressing your question in terms of using best federal higher administration or the National Association of City Tra uh, Transportation Officials. Um, other you know, best practices groups, we integrate those into our solutions, um, as well as looking at the data and trying to pair the root cause of the different crashes to the effect of mitigating um, a countermeasure, if you will. Um, and then you know, leaning on community and, and better understanding uh, the culture of the roadway um, and, and the behaviors and um, how we can really meld those two things because we may not live on that street, so we don't know the day to days, um, but bringing that in as, as well. And that's something that definitely leaning on community to help us um, tailor those uh, proven safety countermeasures to the context that they need it. Yeah, I think so. I think additional motivation there. Uh, my background's in epidemiology, uh, and I have heard you mention a lot about using uh, additional contextual information around people who are utilizing rapid transit, people who are commuting, uh, using pedestrian and, and bicycles. Uh, in our community, we live within a mile of two uh, RTD stations. We have local grocery stores, et cetera. But not that many people walk or bike. I think it really comes down to perceived safety. We don't have sidewalks. Um, we don't have um, great, uh, a great culture around biking and walking, and biking and walking is safer when there's lots of people who are biking and walking. So I think I wanted to just bring that up as potential observation bias in the plan. For people listening on the line, she added the conversation about just the safety culture and the culture of different types of transportation, 
whether people feel comfortable walking or biking. And in her community, which is uh, on the Hamden, sort of the Hamden area, uh, that people don't. They simply don't. And it's probably conditioned by safety and a variety of other factors and how we keep that top of mind when we think about all of this. I'm going to add one thing, and, and I think that people get a little frustrated about just having 311 to call about issues and that feeling that 311 doesn't actually resolve their issues. I've actually experienced that myself. So are, is there a central repository for, for where people can look at and find resources to call various people that they need to they talk about their neighborhoods. <laughs> call me all the time. Yeah, so, so council people are one option, but what other options do people have to report about dangerous intersections in their neighborhoods? I will quickly hijack this super quick to talk about you all, you voters, approved $40 million annually for sidewalks. That's an enormous improvement in our sidewalk budgets. Those fees will start rolling in hopefully this year, hopefully. <laughs> and then that's about a that's about a four thousand percent effective annual increase in our sidewalk budgets. So in areas like University Hills where there's poor sidewalks right now, hopefully those will start getting actually built out. So yeah. hijacking that real quick, I'm gonna give it to someone who can actually answer that question. Okay. So three one, yeah, uh, the three one one question is a really fair one. And we get about three, 4,000 or so calls every year that go into 311 and get routed to our area engineers. And um, that's a lot, as you can imagine. One of the things that I talked with Councilman Hines about and some of the areas that we're really focusing on and how we handle the 311 calls, it really is a really great resource. But let me, let me qualify that. It's a great resource for us to be able to understand and see and track where the priorities are and it actually daylights for us concerns, issues and such. And our traffic engineering team and others absolutely see it, look at it, prioritize it, review it, assess it and move it. Now the challenges with some of that are a couple. Number one, the way that we can respond to those is actually bounded by good old Salesforce and I'm gonna work with them on this which allows us 250 characters to be able to respond to those questions. And so typically what you see in a response from an area engineer would be, you want a, you want a sidewalk here, or excuse me, a crosswalk here, or a traffic light there, it does not meet warrant. And you hear that word a lot. And warrant is something back to these calculations that our traffic engineers and others do, hey, how many people are going through, what's the issue, et cetera. One of the things that we're working on pretty extensively right now is a mindset, a culture set about how do we solve first? How do we add contextual? How do we add sort of where the new methods of handling traffic and the guidelines and the standards that we all follow? How do we infuse those into sort of how do we really seek to solve a problem and really work with that? So that's something, and if our traffic engineer were here, she would talk to you about some of this. Some of the other things that we're looking at is how we do better on the communication side, how we actually daylight all of those issues that are coming through. So I'm sitting and talking with, can we start figuring out ways that we can attach those communications, talking with council members about how we dashboard exactly the questions that are coming in from your districts into 311 so you can see it, you can see what the issue was, you can see how we resolved it and how we talked about it with you. Um, and then those that are coming into the council person's office because you get a lot of those as well. Um, so, and equally on that dashboard, what plans and projects do we have in your area from our capital improvement program? So I think that we have some thoughts and some work to do on how we continue to better communicate, how we even take that safety data and share with you what's happening in your district when it comes to serious bodily injury or fatalities. No, not data people want to see, but certainly data that we have, and I think is important to contextualize it. So I think we've got some work to do. We wanna to continue to work with groups like Inc and others to maybe help us with some of that, our advisory boards and such, as we continue to move it. But actually, I guess I'm gonna say, keep using 311 because it really is an excellent way for us to continue to track all of it, but we need to be able to reflect all that back. Yeah, we're gonna take... I was just going to add to that. We have a, a fix my street guide at the Denver Streets Partnership, which I can send to Adam to forward to you all, which has tips on like start with 311, then contact your council office. Uh, but it also has advice on how to ask the right question. Like first check the Denver Moves Bikes plan and the Safe Routes to School plan. See if there's something already in an existing plan that the city has identified as a potential solution and ask for that and you're more likely to get a yes. So I can forward that to Adam. That's so awesome. That's what you. I was kind of looking for. 
Um, I would just add to to, to the panelists and, and everybody here. You know, Inc. is only a representation of all the RNOs in Denver, and I think there's, there's much. Oh, sorry. Uh, there are meetings happening at different neighborhoods every single month. Um, that it would be great if you know CDOT could come or Dottie could come to these meetings and let folks know um, if we're really talking about doing a culture shift here is coming out um, to RNO meetings and letting them know these resources are available. I had no idea because I live at Irving and 23rd and there was an accident there every, every six weeks until um, what to do about it until Alan suggested, you know, it's more than just um, asking for a stop sign. It's asking for traffic calming measures and, and whatnot. Um, and that's something I didn't even know. So I think there's a lot of in, in neighborhoods and neighborhood groups is like, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, that, that's going on. So, cool. Uh, um, I've already thrown out my seven minute well, uh, <laughs> I think we should pass this around, leave yeah. the mic in the audience, and then we'll be easier. Sir, could you please? Adam? Oh, oh, yeah. What does he want? He wants you to take a picture. Oh, of you. Yeah, we won't. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here really after two years. My name is Taggy, Jack Burry, EU graduate. Um, been involved with the road accidents, traffic, transportation in Europe and United States. Started Michigan, New York. Denver, especially I'm focused here now since my relationship with University of Denver. At one professor, Professor Finister, he was my friend, he was my counselor, he was my professor, and we had a really excellent relationship. But uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, the things between the countries happened in Iran. And I lost my parents, so I had to leave the United States, and it took me 25 years to come back. Um, I don't know from where, because may I request for three minutes? Uh, just um, keep it, keep it uh, what's your very question? focused. Yeah, yeah what's, what's your, your question? question? Uh, the organizer and the creator of this Vision Zero from Sweden that uh, she started it is and created in Swedish, in Sweden, and the Swedish government made this one to a law and uh, procedure. And in Europe, they started it. And they are very successful. We had one week conference about in September there. I've been invited to go there. And, be part of them because they know what I have. Uh, she is now in uh, San Francisco. We have email communication. I haven't been able to go there and see what is the long range goal for this vision zero. New York, the United States has been very successful in vision zero, eliminating the road death injuries. Um, I left because of some problem with uh, authorities to get information and work. So there were also, I have had this problem. I also face uh, closed doors. And they say, go to the website, internet information. And I am very frustrated uh, with the whole system because first of all, I can see some representative here uh, from Denver Police, uh, from Denver Transportation. I would apologize if I go too far, but uh, the roads in Denver are not very sufficient and good. Number two, the drivers, foreigners drive recklessly. Uh, as if you want the information and data, I can give you. Uh, the driving, when you focus on the speeding, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm suggesting uh, whoever issued it, driver's license, 
to these foreigners. I am one of them, but I respect the drivers that if they speak and they only know the map, the Google map, and they cannot speak one word English. I tell them, taxi driver, can you come on Colorado Boulevard? And here, the where is that? I said, in South Korea. Can you come to Korea? Can you come to China? And they say, yeah, put them map. And he has gone somewhere else. And I've been waiting there for two hours. RTD is different. <laughs> And I'm not sure there is the place of education. What is K-12 uh, administrators are responsible for? So, so can I cut you off for a second? So what you're, what you're asking My is- My question is, since the implementing of the Vision Zero in Denver, Colorado is very young, about two, three years, I want to know how successful has been, who is responsible, can we have a meeting to see where are you going, what's your goal, and what is the total accident daily? How many deaths do we have? How many injuries do you have? Okay. How much cost is for government? One accident, how much it costs? Okay. One injury, and how much we reduce this total death in two, three years? I think, as I believe, this uh, Vision Zero has been implemented by thanks. Mr. John or Ralph, that's the, in past two days, we had telephone conversation and we talked. I have a meeting next week with the police. And finally, when they find out I'm serious, they said, okay, let him see what he has to say. I thank you, everybody. I respect you come here because it's important for you. But if you say, let's work together, where is the media? What is newspaper, Denver Post responsibility? What is ABC, CBS, NBC, Colorado, Colorado, Colorado? Where are you? Why don't you report the injuries to the public? PBS. Okay, so this is the, CNN. Yeah. Where this are is, you? This is an oh, sorry, the, no, you. it's okay. This is an ongoing conversation. No, is, no. Is that, can I give oh, you I have successful have you been since implementing this program? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the candid answer is you, you saw the statistics. We're not doing well right now. You're right. It's it's something we should be upset about, you know. Um I got involved in this a few years ago when um uh, a neighbor of mine, a person that goes to my church. Uh, was killed crossing Colfax Boulevard in his wheelchair. Um, and his name is Tim Campbell. Uh, my neighbor Gary was hit um, on uh, Wadsworth Boulevard, hit by two drivers turning left into him um, when they had a red light. Uh, so I, I, I think your frustration is very real and valid. This, you know, um, the, the city of Denver has started to do a very good job. Ross Department is doing excellent work with data of uh, collecting um, where these crashes are happening, how often it's happening, uh, how often it's happening, you know? And I think the reason I'm most excited that Denver leadership has adopted Vision Zero is that the whole idea, is, as you alluded to from Sweden, is that it's a safe systems philosophy, right? It's taking what we've seen in systems like aviation, where our last fatal crash for a commercial airliner due to crash was in 2009. It's taking an approach that we've seen like in, in first responder fire safety of looking at engineering to change the way that we are going to make that a safe system. I'll, I'll give you an example. So for fire safety, we don't have a lot of fires anymore in, in structure fires and homes around here. And it's because we're looking at engineering, we're changing the infrastructure of the buildings. We're, we're using material that is more fire retardant. We're looking at uh, fire suppression systems, fire alarms. And we've been able to engineer largely fires out of our day-to-day -day life. We have not yet done that with our street safety, which is I'm so excited why CDOT's here today, why Director Ford is taking this so seriously, that we can use engineering to design our crashes out of our infrastructure. I'll give you a couple examples where we've seen that so far. Um, we're gonna be installing, you know, just the other day, um, we had two students that were hit at Montbello High School. You know, that community has been asking for the Montbello Loop for a while. It's something we, we hopefully will be able to fund in the not too distant future by putting in things like speed humps, speed bumps, big speed bumps in front of schools. We won't have to worry about drivers speeding in front of schools anymore. Chief Thomas has too much to worry about right now. 
you know, what's going on in the city safety wise, he doesn't need to put a police officer in front of a school every day to make sure people are in speeding. We put concrete there and put bump outs and speed bumps. So 24 seven, 365, our neighborhoods will be safe. So um, another example of that uh, is, is our arterials. But that's, as you said, you know, data is very important and we're seeing most of our fatalities on the streets like federal, like Colfax where Tim was hit, like Wadsworth, you know, Sheridan. Um, it's always the same streets, the 20% or so, 10% or so are streets, they're causing 80% of the fatalities. Um, I'm really excited that CDOT's working on bus rapid transit, looking at things like narrowing lanes. You know, Dottie did a great job in our neighborhood over in Stones Lake. They put in a bike lane, but when they put in that bike lane, they did something really interesting with the lane. They took it from a 12 foot lane down to a 10 foot lane. And 10 foot lanes are naturally going to lower the speed at which drivers go down that street. So there's a lot of things that we can be doing in our community today that I think really, really help with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can speak now, Lina. Yeah, that's the thing. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, good morning. I'm Alejandra Castaneda. I'm a pedestrian dignity advocate. I live in the Berkeley neighborhood in the north side, um, block and a half west of Federal Boulevard. Um, and I love when I hear the word engineering as the priority for our engineering departments and our departments of infrastructure, and that's what they're experts on. Uh, my question is, um, do you feel, both of you, um, that you have enough data to act immediately on making our streets safer based on best engineering practices? And what is it preventing you from acting on best engineering practices? And I'm not talking about the US because we know that our practices have been behind you know leaders world leaders uh so what do you well my question again let me say that again because it was a long question <laughs> do you feel you have enough data to immediately start acting to engineer or engineer our streets to make them safer based on world best practices thank you uh, absolutely um so number one we do have all the data we have uh, good partnerships, we have automation. Um, to your point, we do have a website with all of our crash data that's transparent to the public. I think we we empower people with data and CDOT, if you go to our crash data dashboard, it provides you all the crash data within, this, within a city, a county, but it helps you, gives you an indicator of the trend within your area. And with regards to having the tools, absolutely. Um, we work with our neighboring states. Some of the, I always think of safety as just overlaying more and more strategies, whether it's engineering, whether it's educating the schools around that area. My, 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 my question is about engineering because we know education hasn't worked with educating people for decades right, and right. enforcing people for decades, you know, unintended consequences without integrity. Engineering, please. Yes, absolutely. Within engineering, we have our proven safety countermeasures that are from FHWA. Um, that, that provides us a toolkit, whether it's speed enforcement, automated speed enforcement. That's another thing that we're doing through engineering is we're putting um, corridors up where we're going to do automated speed enforcement. But engineering-wise, absolutely. When it comes to road calming, we know all the techniques that work. We're in close contact with the cities, the counties, uh, fellow state DOTs, but yes, absolutely. What's preventing you from you know, implementing those actions urgently? What's preventing you so we can help? Absolutely. I think resources is always the key to helping us get more out there quickly and low cost solutions, right? So I think money. when it, money and time. So when it comes to an engineered pro project, there's processes that you have to go through for environmental, for utilities. Right away, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the background. So those larger projects, I would say, are three-year pipeline projects. But the low-cost solutions, like um, shortening the distance the pedestrian has to walk across federal, let's say, right? That that's part of kind of building those sidewalks out or visually doing striping bulbs up, bulb outs to to get the pedestrians a head start, right? And then, as Amy mentioned, we're looking at signals, the lead pedestrian intervals getting the pedestrians to start walking so that the vehicles can see them or bicyclists, right? Um, is, is, an, is a huge engineering benefit that 
I don't think a lot of people see or notice, but when you see those peds get the green light and you're still at the red, that means they're putting peds first so that for, for their safety. But absolutely, we have can the- we, uh, Can we uh, switch funds for you know, expanding highways or like I-70 or other things into these things that make our cities more livable? Yeah, I think for the low cost solutions, we do have a funding pot that we can kind of look at the, at the hot spots. But when it comes to our 10 year plan, we have our huge, our large capital improvement projects like Ford Hill, um, Central 70 is just wrapping up. So those kind of projects we can't pull from, but we definitely can, can prioritize with the low cost solutions. We do have funds for that. That was actually one of, you all are asking all the questions I had written down here, which is amazing. So um, one of the questions was, does Vision Zero, does, does Vision Zero have enough funding? And if it needs more, what would it do? No. Okay. I've been pulling up, if you saw me on my phone, I was pulling up a bunch of data analysis I've done on this. So CDOT has $310 per capita transportation funding. It is the second lowest among every single state that we touch. Every other state, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, Nebraska, all have higher state per capita transportation funding than we do. We only beat out Oklahoma. So, and, you know, our funding is like 50 yeah, the Denver funding is also really poor. So on the vulnerable road user uh, funding for those projects, traffic calming, crosswalks, bike lanes, sidewalks, that sort of thing, we rank far below other peer cities who are doing a lot of work on this. Denver has about $32 per capita in terms of our transportation funding for VRU projects. Um, that ranks very far below New York. Yeah, vulnerable road user, so pedestrian cyclists. Um, that is far below what I would, you know, so for example, Tempe, Arizona, which is a much smaller city, they're sitting at $90, right? Uh, Portland is sitting at 130. So we really sit far below a bunch of good peer cities in this realm. Vision Zero, their annual budget requirements to implement their action plan sits uh, at around, I wanna say 6.6 .6 to $11.2 million for staffing and capital costs. They're sitting right now at most at like one to 2 million. So um, the answer, no, it, it's, it's a yes and. There are things we can definitely reallocate money from, but our total funding amount just sits far below other peer agencies, other peer states and cities. So yes, we need Vision Zero and their ask isn't actually that huge in terms of a city budget, but it's also not all of that funding is discretionary. Not all of it is gated off, some of it is gated off for specific purposes, right? Like US DOT, I assume there's a lot of really stringent regulations on what the, those federal funds can be used for. So really it's general fund dollars or special revenue fund dollars, like getting really specific in our budget. That's the stuff we can actually pull from. And we just don't have a lot of it. So we need to increase funding and reallocate funding where we can. And also make sure those capital projects, those capital programs where the really big pots of funds are, make sure that those are allocated to traffic calming, to bike lanes, to transit projects, to sidewalks. That's really where, in my mind, when I think about the budgets, where we can make the most difference. Yeah, I would just add a little bit of where does the money come from, right? It's always nice to be able to access other people's money. <laughs> and the good news is right now, there is actually a fair amount of federal funding that's available for traffic safety, much more than there has been in the past. And so we're really glad to see the city being really aggressive in applying for those grants and want them to get as many as possible. That's one-time funding that doesn't address the, the long-term problem. There's shifting money from one thing to another. I do wanna give CDOT credit Yes, they just spent a ton of money on widening I-70. Yes, they're spending a ton of money on Floyd Hill I-70. But in the most recent update to their 10-year plan, they decided to not include widening I-25 and instead include money for bus rapid transit on corridors like Colfax. <laughs> but still, that's one-time funding, right? And ultimately, the long-term problem is at a base level, we just don't have enough money in the annual budget for transportation. And you know where that money has to come from? Us. 
there isn't this like magic pot of government money. It comes from us as taxpayers, people who pay fees for services. And are we willing to pay more? Are we willing to pay more for parking? Are we willing to pay more for taxes? That money has to come from somewhere collectively that we're willing to pay for. And again, it comes back to political will and you communicating that to your elected leaders, how you want them to be raising money and what you want them to use it for. I, I would add to what I think Jill hit the nail on the head. Um, the, the, the most challenging part about being on the Dottie Advisory Board is we hear all these very valid concerns from University Hills to Congress Park and Montbello and Westwood and elsewhere of people wanting more livable, vibrant streets and safe streets in Denver. And the realistic answer I have to give most people is that's a great project. You should put it in 311 so it's documented so that the city knows that it should come. But the realistic answer I always tell them is this is probably not going to happen anytime soon because we do not have the funding for it right now, not only on our neighborhood streets, but also on our high injury network corridors where this is happening. I think we had a question in the back first. So behind you, Jerry, sorry. And then uh, I'm wondering, just like listening to the couple of questions and a couple of the ways that things were put out is, um, can we, if we know what works, if uh, wh why don't we just make that to the why do we have to have a warrant to study to understand that 20 miles an hour is the right thing like it's one of the frustrations that i have a little bit is that the warrants will kind of and i don't even know if i can properly define what a warrant is but it it seems that it's like we're basing decisions upon said i think you said the 85 percent rule so it's like, it doesn't fit the 85%. Why can't we just say 20 miles an hour is the right thing? Narrower roads are the right thing. Every time we repay the road, we're going to do it this way. And it doesn't need a three-year study and flip it. And then you have to prove why the speed should be more than 20 miles an hour or why the lane should be wider than what it is. You know, set it, make the vision the reality and then prove why you can't do what the vision is. I know that was pretty good. Like the crossing principle, right? Yeah. Right. And the short is we are working, we are doing that. We are starting to do that. And so a couple of things that have happened that have changed. Obviously, you know, we've done 20 miles per hour citywide. We're in the process of putting those signs up right now, back to money. It's taken us a little while to get it all out. Um, on top of that, we created, we're, we're taking that common sense approach, if you will, through things like complete streets and complete streets guidelines that are advocating for that and where we know we need to go and all that and driving that in. So we have complete streets guidelines that have been approved. They're now working through our rules and regulations. We're matching that with our policies. Why does that matter? Because engineers care about the standards and how we do it because it's important on how we assure safety, all of those kinds of things. We want to make that work. We also are looking at how we do pilots and how we move much more quickly. Our transition committee and others are like, just go do it and then assess it. And so we actually are going to be doing some things like that. I was telling some uh, folks that you might see some sample testing for us on some things like how we do slowing down and, and on roadways with things like rumble strips and some others to start slowing people down as they come into intersections or difficult areas and such. So we are adopting that approach both by rule, by regulation, by standard, and then by process and sort of how we want to do it. Uh, I think Could you already. Um, I just, my name is Gertie Grant and I live on Lincoln Street, just north of Alameda. And I will always refer to it as Interstate Lincoln because there's a lot of rapid transit and it's not in public transportation going up that street. Um, I, this panel and what I'm learning here today is really blowing my mind and I want to thank you all so much for giving up your Saturday morning. I have a couple of, of thoughts. One is why not whenever a traffic citation is issued, increase it depending on the weight of the vehicle involved. 
that way there would be a disincentive for people um, um, violating the law. Secondly, in all of this, and I sort of hate to ask this question, but way back when, and Mike Henry may be the only one in the room that was around when environment, the impact on pollution was one of the cons main concerns in creating one-way streets to get people in and out of wherever they wanted to go more easily with fewer stop signs, fewer traffic lights, et cetera. And I'm wondering in all of this, are you, is there any measurement being taken of the impact of the increased stop signs, which I think are great, and the, and the um, pedestrian crossing happening immediately, practically, when you push the button at a traffic light that has that kind of um, capability, are you looking at the impact on air pollution? <laughs> I can take a quick stab at answering the first question. Uh, I think you're exactly right. Through pricing is how at the local level we can incentivize people to make better decisions about which vehicles they're, they're purchasing and also simultaneously raise revenues. Um, that uh, Your suggestion's a new one I hadn't heard before of tying it to if you get a traffic citation. Um, I think a more direct way is when people register their vehicle with the city or the state making the price of that registration. Uh, there was actually a bill that would do exactly that that died so again, it comes back to political will and communicating to your elected leaders that this is something important that you would back up. Um, another example is in Paris, they increase, they charge for parking and the amount that you have to pay to have permission, your residential parking permit is based on the size of your vehicle. So that's another way the city could do it. Um, but again, this is going to be hard. People don't like paying for things that they've gotten for free, right? And so it, it relies on all of you speaking up and expressing your support for doing something like that. Okay, we're, we're, we got Joel here and then yeah. we're... And just, yeah. just to pollution and emissions, and we can talk really quickly. There are a lot of methods. We have a commitment as a city, as you know, to carbon reduction. It's pretty serious. That include, includes things like electrification of vehicles, supporting that and others. There are dynamic things we can do and how we manage our roadways that also support how we reduce uh, idling time, et cetera, for vehicles. Now, that is a counterintuitive answer to how we think about sort of people first approaches on our, our, our corridors and such. So how we put all those together, you there are other all things that you're seeing around the world. In fact, in fact, I sent some of this to a team just last week things and considerations like low emission zones, where you're actually looking at cars and incentivizing cars that are higher, better emission, electric and other in the area, or disincentivizing, i.e. penalizing vehicles that are older, et cetera. There are a lot of topics with that related to equity and things. So it, there are some difficult mixes and how we put together, how we think about sort of our carbon reduction, but we could sit and have a good conversation about that. I just, I just want to add one thing, and this is from the engineering perspective with regards to pollution. When those stop signs or those signals go in, we go through a modeling process, right? And so those stop signs actually do provide a, a purpose. It might provide more efficiency through the larger network, although at that instant spot, it may feel like you're putting more emissions, but if that stop control is not there, you could be providing congestion in other areas. So we always model it just like a game. We say, hey, there's this, this many vehicles going this way. This is how many are turning. And we have a, a network model that we pretty much hit play. And you can see the congestion where a stop sign might be helpful or maybe used as a speed yeah. speed calming measure. So I think that, and I'm, I'm gonna go to Joel right after this, but I'm gonna tell you something you're probably not gonna like. I have an electric vehicle and electric vehicles are actually heavier than gas vehicles because of all the batteries in them. So that's something we're gonna to have to address. Joel, go ahead. And then we're gonna take the question online. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm proud that I'm proud that INC was among the first organizations that banded together to form the Vision Zero Coalition and call on Denver committing to the Vision Zero uh, commitment. Um, and, I, and I think it's safe to say that in the time since that commitment was expressed by Denver, uh, a crisis has not been treated like a crisis. 
All right. And so I'm, I'm very energized by Amy, you saying that uh, Denver's going to have an ambitious goal. You're going to unlock the creativity of your staff. You're going to ask the community to understand we're treating a crisis like a crisis. And 50% in two years is a great interim goal. At the same time, there's these budget realities. So in my mind, I'm trying to anticipate what can we do that would have a 50% reduction in fatalities and serious injuries in two years um, with hopefully more resources, but realistic resources. And, and the things that are coming to mind are very kind of tactical, temporary. Uh, I think of the, the wonderful photo that Jill had showing a very wide roadway. How quickly would any of us drive down that street? The answer is very quickly because it's freaking highway, right? Um, so whether it's barrels and bollards or whatever it is, that becomes a smaller roadway for cheap is the kind of thing you can do in 10 years. Extent, uh, two years, two years. An extensive use of automated enforcement. So it's not as your predecessor did when this year's budget was presented, just asking people to try harder. Instead, it's people start to learn that they will be ticketed. These are the things that come to mind, but can you help us envision um, what we'll all be experiencing and people in this room will be going back to their neighborhoods as these roll out and say, they're not doing this for fun folks. We have a crisis, we're treating it like a crisis. Concur. Um, just really quickly, um, Ralph knows this, but in about three weeks, we're gonna sit and talk about exactly that. That's all the details, Ralph. Um, and we're going to share with you all of our countermeasures, all of the steps that we think we're going to be taking in the next two years to try to do that. And absolutely, automated speed enforcement is on the table. And we're grateful that the state legislation just allowed us to do that. Um, June and some others, some of you who participated in this, have uh, approached us with a white paper that we are really grateful for and ask that you affect accelerate that talks about the policies of how we implement automated speed enforcement, because there are a lot of things we need to consider, such as equity, how we layer it in, how we ensure that it's affordable, how we ensure it's safe, where it goes, et cetera. Um, but we're, we've had, in fact, just a kickoff meeting with uh, DPD uh, just here a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about that and the city's, we're not going to say full commitment, but commitment that, that we believe this is absolutely something we should move forward with, but we want to do so very, very thoughtfully with communication with our, with our community. And so we're going to share all of this with you. We're going to talk about every single piece of it, and we would love your feedback and input on it as we move forward. And we're working on how we pull up those resources together to be able to deploy this quickly. And share how? Uh, we're going to do some media and some community meetings uh, where we're sitting and talking about that. And each of our advisory groups and, uh, and others were coming to the Mayor's Pedestrian Advisory Committee, the Mayor's Bicycle Advisory Committee, the Transportation Advisory Committee, just meeting with Jill, with meeting with team, with meeting with Inc. and others to have some of those conversations. So you can see it, understand it, taste it, know what we're going to put in, and then work with us because not all of those are easy things. And some community members may be, gosh, I don't love this solution. But how we work together, we think is really important. We have one, one last one. question here, and then we're going to go online, and then we have to wrap up. I wish we could do this for another hour, but we, we cannot. I just, um, have a question so about, start. about the. You just need to turn it on. So it turns okay. off. Um, in your statistics of fatal crashes, uh, alcohol and the drug. Um, so, you know, it figures into the crack. And what are you doing in the Vision Zero to, to address that part of the equation? Distracted driving. driving. Yeah. Yep. Impaired driving. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so Colorado State Patrol has a what, what they call a roving team focused on um, where there are more likelihood of, of having folks driving um, under the influence. And that hasn't been that has been a highly successful program, but they are tracking the data. Right. So if, if you get or if somebody got the bid, drives under the influence, gets a ticket, gets arrested, CSP is using all that data 
um, in real time to move their roving units to put in those, those checkpoints. And as far as education and outreach, we've got our NHTSA funding grants that pushes out media, pushes out programs that reach out to schools. Um, so we're really flexing in that area. It's, it's, a, it's a highly funded uh, behavioral campaign that I think a lot of people could have access to. But um, again, this, this is about sharing information. We do have a crash data dashboard. We have our NHTSA funding that helps um, push out education and campaigns with regards to education for, for all. Yeah, Rolf can answer that, I think. But before I hand it to Rolf, I just wanted to say the best way to prevent drunk driving, distracted driving, is to give people a good option other than driving to <laughs> where they need to go. If you're sitting on a bus, it doesn't matter whether you're drunk or looking at your cell phone, you have a professional driver whose job it is to get where you go safely. And part of that is investing in transit, investing in bike lanes, things like that. Part of it is land use. It's kind of mind blowing to me that we mandate parking at bars. <laughs> We're saying, go here and get drunk, but make sure that you have a place to put your car so you can drive home. We could be using that space instead of allowing people to park in front of the, the bar to have a dedicated bus lane in front of the bar so that people have options other than driving to get there. Okay, so what, uh, we, you want to go to So I, I just have one question online. Yeah, so, we've been kind of ignoring it. Yeah, and, and we apologize to everybody that's online. <laughs> go to the next um, meeting. There have been a lot of questions here. Um, that we're not going to get to, um, but I think this goes to is a good wrap up question for um, the fact that we are at a, at a large neighborhood meeting. And I just want to say thank you to everybody that came here today. We had uh, between online and here we have 50, 53 people I think at this meeting. Um, so which is the largest meeting that I've been to uh, this year so far. So thanks so much for everybody. And. Um, yeah, with the sirens in the background, I, I know that there are a couple of points in the Vision Zero plan right now um, that's online that talk about working with neighborhoods. And um, Carol Hunter, I'm going to um, paraphrase a question that you have online, which is uh, creating activists is mandatory. Giving people specific tools for becoming activists is essential. How will neighborhoods be part of this? Um, otherwise, you know, we as neighbors are just relying on others to do the work for us. So I, I, if, if you all can, you know, speak to that a little bit. Yeah, well, um, number one, I just want to remind everyone, we do have a community hub for this, the Dottie Advisory Board. It meets uh, every second Tuesday on Zoom from 4 to 6 p.m. If you Google Denver Dottie, and go down to the bottom of the website. There is a uh, portal there that you can register for meeting. You can register for public comment. I think it's a director forge usually there every month that she can be. Other top dotty leadership is, is there. I think it's important we continue to hear your voices on this stuff. You can need to continue to pressure your city council members. I'm so glad Councilman Hines was here earlier today. Um, and, and I think the state leaders as well. So much of our funding in order for us to be able to do this is gonna come from the state. Um, the other thing I would say is please, it feels sometimes like a black hole, please continue to put stuff into 311. If it doesn't go into 311, it doesn't get measured. So I, I think that's very important for, for all of us to consider as well. And the last thing I would say is get involved with our nonprofits that are leading this work. Bicycle Colorado and more importantly, the Denver Streets Partnership has a whole academy that will teach you how to engage and do this stuff. And we're so lucky to have a nonprofit like that in Denver that's leading on this. Yeah. On the subject of engaging with public officials, they do read their emails, they do look at their stuff, and even if they don't personally look at it, their staff looks at it. We are currently nearing the end of the legislative session, but there's still a few bills up that are really important. I'm going to quickly throw two numbers at you, two bills. So SB Senate Bill 2465, that's a hand street driving bill. I know Denver Streets Partnership is in an opposed position. The bicycle lobby is in a support position. Opinions vary. Come talk to us about that bill. But one we can all agree on is SB 24195. Um, it is a new protectable mobile road users bill. It is going to set declining annual fatality targets for CDOT and give a little bit of money for this infrastructure. 
Um, so get engaged on those bills and more importantly, go talk to your public officials, send them emails, send them calls, have a meeting with them, with your city council people, try to get with the mayor's team, try to get with your state representative and state senator and or federal representative and federal senators. Across the board, that public engagement is really important with your elected officials. Um, we need to wrap up. A lot of people don't have the privilege to be here and to, you know, our, our, our paid employees and elected officials are being paid to make decisions on, you know, on behalf of our collective bargaining. They have the data, they have the best practices. Okay. They can do it without us showing up. Okay. Just ask. We got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, the two bills are Senate Bill 2465 and Senate Bill 24195. Uh, if you actually go back to my last slide, I don't know if you can do that. I have a link to, as uh, Alan mentioned, we do advocacy trainings. Um, we don't have our full-blown academy open right now, which is an eight-week training, but we have uh, just one-time orientation sessions that you can join. It's the what can you do slide. Oh, yes. It, so bit.ly, bit.ly slash advocate number four streets. Um, go to that. You can fill out our interest form and join one of our advocacy orientations. Give you some quick skills and tips and tricks for being a better advocate for safe streets in your neighborhood. And what is the date of the road ahead? Uh, 24, 25th, that Thursday. Thursday, April 25th. Uh, there is at DU an event called The Road Ahead that's all about bus rapid transit. So if you're curious about bus rapid transit and how it can help make our streets safer and better for everybody, please register for that event. I can share with Adam the link to the registering for that event. Okay, I, I, I know everybody's questions did not get answered. This is a continuing conversation, right? This is continuing activism. We're gonna keep talking about this until we get these numbers lowered. And, and I, I think this was an amazing conversation. And I really want to thank you all for being here and for participating and everyone that was in the room. And I say this every delegate meeting, please come to the meetings in person if you can. It's always better and easier if you're here to handle things. And, I, and uh, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Keith because we still do have a, a little bit of business to do and that's why we're wrapping it up. Uh, and, and you do not have to sit up there anymore, but thank you so much. Yeah, just a huge, huge thank you to everybody that came and um, giving up some of your Saturday morning to come and, and speak with us uh, here today. And, and for everybody that came and to be part of this conversation, I think, you know, we're going to work to do this more um, and have more of these kinds of conversations um, moving forward with INC and different departments um, within the city and, and different issues that are going on around Denver. Um, and I hope that maybe our panelists will stick around for at least a couple more minutes and answer any questions that people have. Um, afterwards, um, as well, uh, you know, privately or whatnot. And I apologize to everybody that I think we're going to go hopefully only five minutes or so um, past uh, 11 o'clock. Um, so if you're able to stick around, great. But if you have to go, that's great. That's understandable, too. I do, if, um, yeah, if Amy and June, you wouldn't mind moving a little bit, um, that'd be great. So just a couple of um, housekeeping and announcements. Um, I did want to uh, say that Inc. has a lot of stuff coming up uh, over the next few months, and I, I just hope that um, folks will be involved, and um, we've got a lot, of, a lot of things going on. The first is um, the April 25th uh, Zoning, Planning, and Sustainability Meeting um, is going to actually be part of an Earth Week Summit. Um, we're, we're sending folks to um, uh, Joan Gregerson, uh, has put on, I think it's the fifth annual uh, Earth Week Summit online. And April 25th is Metro Denver Day. Uh, so she's actually gonna have quite a few speakers from Denver uh, talking about different um, environmental and sustainability uh, initiatives in the city. And the person who's gonna be speaking at the 6.30 time slot, which is our normal like ZAP um, and uh, climate and sustainability meeting time is actually Ian Thomas DeFoya who was uh, the ZAP chair for uh, a number of years. So um, we're encouraging folks to go to this 
event. Um, it's online, it's all free. Um, the, the link is right there at the bottom. Um, it's bit.ly uh, slash EWS24, and we'll send out an email with that information as well. Um, moving on. Everybody's got this on their calendar to save the date. Um, we're going to be in uh, five points. And then what else? Uh, I think. Oh, uh, May 13th. Uh, Jane, do you want to talk about Spiral Garden real quick? Yeah, hi. One of the youth organizations that received funding from us a couple of years ago, and again this year, is called the Spiral Garden. It's out in Montbello. This group of kids have taken a vacant lot and made it into a beautiful garden. We have by a couple of the apple trees that they have. Uh, I asked, can we come see what's going on? And she said, of course. So we're going to have a field trip out there on Monday, the 13th of May. She said, um, tell everyone to bring closed-toed shoes because there are goat heads, the little sticky things that are in. We will be planting and most likely moving some materials to build the outer mounds. Feel free to bring food waste, any fresh fruits or vegetables, coffee or tea. No meat products, oils, salts, and sugars, or processed foods. So they have taken this space and made it into a beautiful garden using mainly compostable kind of things and changing it so much. The kids made their own video on it a couple of years ago, so I invite you to meet us out there. It's at 4879 Crown Boulevard. Um, it's a little funky to find. But if you're there at four, we'll get a little tour, and then the kids will come at four thirty, and they will show you what they're doing. Great. So I have four thirty up there, but it's four o'clock is when folks should show up. We need to show up at four. The kids will be there at four thirty. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Jane. Um, the next thing on uh, May eighteenth, and I haven't gotten a whole lot of information about this, um, but I, I did want to get it out there. Um, for folks to put on their calendars is the, there's going to be an RNO equity summit um, that's sponsored by Radian, which is um, a group that we tried to work with last year. Um, it's an architecture firm that has actually been doing some surveying and some work with West Side RNOs on um, equity issues uh, in RNOs and, and getting, making sure, trying to make sure that RNOs um, are more representative of neighborhoods, um, especially low income neighborhoods. And I think trying to address some of the issues that may come up um, with in terms of language and also, um, you know, uh, child care and things like that, and meeting times. Um, so they're going to have a whole summit on the 18th of uh, May at their building, which is at uh, 3264 Larimer Street in Rhino. Um, and as soon as we find out more information, we'll uh, get that get that out to everybody. And then I think we are to committee reports. Yeah, um, Joel, is there, uh, we're gonna do a quick committee reports. Do you have anything for transportation? No, no report, we'll be meeting again next month. Okay, great. Um, DEI, I didn't see Lamont online. I don't think so. Lamont, are you online? Okay, I don't know if there's anybody here. I don't, I don't know if there's anything else to report other than we passed our DEI policy, policy. last month. So and, we're very and, excited about that. And we'll be working for the, the training and education piece that we're doing in June. Great. DEI will be involved for that. Great. Perfect. Um, climate and sustainability. You pretty much gave the report, which yeah. is April 25th. Perfect. For that amazing event. And then I think Joanna is online. Yeah. I think Joanna, you're online? I am. Thank you. I, I'm sorry I have to be off camera, but I just wanted to update um, Denver INC on what the Education Committee is doing. Uh, the Education Committee has partnered with Daniel Archuleta at Surpassing Distinction on a community-led in initiative process to meet the unique and comprehensive challenges our neighbors and school face with declining enrollment. Um, we're very excited uh, that their concepts apply to this evidence-based and community impact model that lifts communities' voices, and so excited to um, hopefully start an R and O in the area that is needed with that declining enrollment. Um, we um, have been working on that and open to others that um, have this same issue in mind with the declining enrollment and how we can help as a community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, 
And then ZAP is the same, um, the Earth Week Summit uh, that we already talked about as well. Is there anything else for ZAP? No. Okay, great. Um, and then I just wanted to say there's a lot of opportunities for folks that want to get more involved with INC um, this year. Uh, we have a couple of amazing events that I think, um, one we're just talking about right now, which is our summer event um, that uh, I think is, you know, we're really trying to um, connect with communities more, um, especially in areas that we haven't felt are represented in INC uh, as much. So we're excited to go to Five Points um, this, this summer and then in the fall. Uh, we have an event, we have our annual um, neighborhood awards event that we um, are hopefully going to, uh, we're in the process of signing a uh, contract for a space on November 13th um, on South, I believe it's South Santa Fe. Um, yeah. Okay. And it's the um, Town Hall Collaborative. Town Hall Collaborative, which is an all female owned business. Woo! Uh, down there that is um, an event center. And uh, we're very excited to partner with them this year on, on this event. And I think it's gonna be, it's a, it's a phenomenal space. Uh, we went and checked it out last month and it's just gonna be a great night um, in November. So we're definitely looking for help um, for, for putting that on. Uh, and then um, the Arno 101 project, um, Lamone and Mark are not here, Greg. I don't know if you want to talk about this or anybody else, uh, but we are working on um, building some resources for RNOs uh, this year. Is there anybody that wants to? I'll be happy. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, part of this project, what we're trying to do is make sure that RNOs have support and really know, um, as Joel puts it, how to RNO. How do you get formed? How do you register? What's your checklist every year? What do you? How do you organize your neighborhood, block builders, all these different resources? How do you enter into good neighbor agreements? So we're really building this resource. There is currently a resource on the Inc. Um, website that's more of how you interact with cities and you know where do you go to find your dog catcher kind of thing. But this is much more about RNO, and that's why we're calling it RNO 101, or as again Joel puts it, how to RNO. We're working on it. Great, thanks so much, Lou. And then just finally, you know, once again, next month we're going to be at the Table Public House, um, which is off of Evans. I, I, yeah, if you haven't been to the Table Public House, it's a great venue, and so um, I, I just highly encourage folks to come to that. It's also right off the bike path, and it's also right off the bike path near the river. Um, it's it's a beautiful venue and a really great space, despite the fact that I think. The owners in Iowa Hawkeyes fan because um, there's <laughs> Iowa stuff everywhere. But um, uh, and I, I did just want to highlight this again that um, you know uh, Rosedale, Harvard, Gulch, and Overland Park are taking advantage of a program that we just sent up. And if your RNO is interested in doing something similar, we would love to hear from you. Um, so please, uh, you can contact um, myself at, uh, at the president at. Uh, denverinc.org or um, membership at denverinc.org. Can you um, tell them what everyone with CASR means just in case? Oh, CASR is the Climate and Sustainability. Climate Action. Climate and Action and Sustainability. Resilience. Yeah. And Resiliency. Resilience. And Resiliency uh, Office. So, and the other quick question I had for our, um, for Jill and Sam was there's a um, somebody that's asked that we could put your presentation, send your presentations out. Would that be possible? Okay, so we'll put those on our website um, and, and send links to them as well um, uh, in our email that goes out. Jill, are you okay with that too? Okay, great, perfect. They're part of the recording too. And they're part of the recording as well. So is there any other questions or anything else uh, for the good of the word? <laughs> great, everybody, oh, Michael. Just for the this chief is considering their own meeting, and we would be very capable, I'm sure, of having Do you have? Yeah. 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 Thank you. It's honestly been an honor just to sit here and listen. You know, obviously, this is something that is near and dear to me. I mean, you know, traffic safety, I think, is a part of public safety. And so, uh, certainly something that's important to me, uh, you know, uh, very encouraged to be able to work with, with Amy and Dottie. And, um, you know, and 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I find that it's it's often very important to, to listen to community because I think often community tells you things that you don't know. I think, you know, Amy, you know, uh, made a comment earlier about data and, and data does tell us a lot of things, but sometimes data doesn't necessarily tell us what community is truly concerned about. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many community meetings I go to where I think, oh my goodness, they're gonna, they're they're really gonna want to know about all these burglaries and robberies that have been occurring in this community, um, and you know we're you know, scrambling to find um, you know, solutions to to those challenges. And then we get to the meeting, and there, and you know, we tell them about the the challenge and what we're doing about it, and they're like, okay, yeah, well, we want to know what you're going to do about all that drug racing that, that 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 we hear going on at night. And so it really just I think um, grounds us in understanding that. Um, this is really what community policing is all about. It's, it's about listening to community and really understanding um, you know, what, what their challenges and concerns are and then working together to solve them. So yeah, that's why I was just sitting here very quietly, just kind of listening because it's important, I think, to hear what's, you know, what's important to community so that, so that we can all you know, be responsive to that. So thank you.